We're live. Thank you. I see the live stream. Will sergeants begin your recordings? Recording. According to the computer, all set. According to the cloud is up. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Polite, you may begin with opening. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on sanitation and solid waste management. To all council members and staff, please turn on a video at this time. Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning. I am Council Member Antonio Reynoso, Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Welcome to this oversight hearing on the topic, Advancements in Residential and Commercial Solid Waste Management Systems. As this session draws to a close and my tenure as Chair of the Committee, I think it's important to celebrate some of the landmark advancements that we have made in how the city handles its solid waste and look to the future and consider areas for future improvements to help the city achieve its zero waste goals. This session has been nothing short of remarkable for this committee. We passed local law 199 of 2019, the commercial waste zone law, which completely transformed the private carding system that was endangering workers and the public, wreaking havoc on our environment and providing poor service to many of their customers. We passed local law 152 of 2018, the waste equity law, which prevents certain communities from bearing the brunt of truck traffic, air and noise pollution from waste transfer stations in their neighborhoods. We reduce single use bag use and pollution by passing a five cent fee on paper bags to accompany the state ban on plastic bags. And we continue to push for residential and commercial waste systems that would advance uh, progress to sending zero waste landfill. And I just wanna know off script that the sky hasn't fallen because of any of these pieces of legislation, um, <laughs> which you would think would happen uh, during our debates. Um, despite the achievements of this committee, the city still has a long way to go and much, much more to do when it comes to improving how we handle waste in New York City. In 2015, the de Blasio administration set an ambitious goal of sending zero waste to land for by 2030. The council and advocates agreed with this goal as a necessary and urgent step that New York City should take to combat climate change. However, since the goal was announced six years ago, we have had to fight to for nail to encourage the administration to enact even the basic measures to achieve the goals that they themselves set out to achieve. As my time as chair comes to a close, I hope that the incoming council and mayor administration will pick up the mantle by prioritizing the zero by 30 goal while continuing to improve sanitation practices in New York City. Today, I look forward to hearing testimony from DSNY and the public about their experience with implementation of the landmark local laws that we have passed under my tenure. In addition, I look forward to hearing advice for how the city could be doing more to reduce waste now and in the future. Uh, I just wanna say, this is sort of a hearing, an exit memo hearing. Uh, and very rarely during exit memos, do you, you know, talk about what you've done it's mostly uh, about what you haven't done and what you're hoping the, the future folks uh, take on. Um, I wanna thank uh, everyone that's on this, in this committee um, over the last four years and shorter, um, like Council Member Riley who came in a little later after that, um, for all the work that you guys have done. You can say, um, you know, without hesitation that this committee uh, took on tough battles, um, discussed them in a very, in a very, um, in a way that was uh, relevant, productive, um, and I am is one of the, the best committees, I believe, in all of the city of New York. Um, and it also happens because we have amazing advocates that continue to push us every single day to make sure that we're doing the best we can, and arguably um, the greatest uh, team at the SNY that um, agrees with the advocates uh, most of the time and is looking themselves to push as far as they can to turn this tanker of a of, a, of, a, of an agency around um, in a positive way or advance it in a positive way. Um, so again, I just wanna thank everyone um, for being an ally with me and supporting me. I wanna acknowledge the council members um, that are here, but also that have been uh, fighting the good fight related to sanitation. Council Member Chin, 
um, who has the most time spent on these committees, um, who actually stays here, listens, asks questions, and then waits for everyone else to ask questions, and is very um, intentional about, um, about her time and her responsibility as a chair. So I want to thank Councilmember Chin, Councilmember Cabrera uh, from the Bronx, who always uh, puts his people first, um, always um, looking to mitigate any negative impacts of anything that we would be doing, no matter how uh, promising of a goal it might seem on paper, um, what it looks like practically is very important for him uh, because, you know, especially in the Bronx, folks have suffered for a long time under, you know, conditions of pollution um, and environmental justice. So I want to thank Councilmember Cabrera, Cabrera for his fight um, for his community in the Bronx. Um, we also have Councilmember Riley that is new, also from the Bronx, but in a short time has been engaged and, and very thoughtful um, about how he's looking out for the interests of the Bronx. And I hope that as he stays on, um, which he will, that he continues this work and maybe he'll fight to stay on uh, the sanitation committee. Um, so thank you again to all of uh, the council members that are here right now. Um, and now uh, I'd like to ask the committee to swear in the administration. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Reynoso. I'm just gonna go over a few procedural items before swearing in the administration. So I am Council Jessica Steinberg Alvin, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. For members of the public, we will be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. I apologize, I have low bandwidth. I'm gonna turn off my video and continue with the instructions. Once you are called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any, when it is your turn to speak. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the Department of Sanitation will be Commissioner Edward Grayson, Greg Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs, and Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Edward Grayson. I do. Deputy Commissioner Greg Anderson. I do. Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson. I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Good morning, Chair Reynoso and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I'm Edward Grayson, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important topic. With me this morning are Bridget Anderson, our Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability, and Gregory Anderson, our Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs at the Department. First, I would like to thank you, Chair Reynoso, for your leadership advocacy and the support over the last eight years as chair of this committee. You have been a key partner in our efforts to reform the commercial waste sector, to promote environmental justice, and to chart a path to zero waste for New York City. The department looks forward to continuing this work as you take on your new role as Brooklyn Borough President. I'd also like to thank all the outgoing members of the city council, particularly those who have served on this committee, for their service to their communities and to the city of New York. You've been true partners in our work to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. And lastly, I wanna thank all those here to testify today, advocates, industry experts, citizens, and others. 
In this administration, we have made a transformative change to our waste management sector. We have invested in new facilities that embrace sustainable transportation and provide relief to communities that have carried the burden of our waste for decades. We have created new and expanded programs to divert an ever-growing assortment of products from landfill and give them new life. We have enacted policies to reduce our, our reliance on plastics and reform the commercial waste sector. In my testimony today, I will highlight a few of these achievements and some of the greatest opportunities we face in the next several years as we look to work on the new, with the new administration and the new council and all of our stakeholders to continue our important work to New York to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. Afterwards, my team and I will be happy to answer your questions. The department's more than 6,000 sanitation workers collect an average of 12,000 tons of waste, refuse, recyclables, and organics every day. Our, res our residential waste stream is built upon their work, nearly all of it manual and physical labor. Twice or three times each week, residents and property managers bring their waste out to the curb in bags and in bins, and it is collected at the hands of our sanitation workers. Because of the nature of our city, densely built, diverse, and the neighborhoods and conflicting demands for space in both buildings and in the public sphere, we have relied on the same approach with some small variation for over a century. In the last several years, we have employed innovative approaches to improve our collection operations and service delivery. These include new technology systems for routing, operations management, and resource tracking, as well as collection methods using dual bins and specifically trucks to increase our operational flexibility in rollout of curbside composting and other programs. The department is also exploring new models for waste set out and collection, including approaches that will move waste set out from the sidewalk and into the roadway. This month, we are releasing a procurement to select MWBE vendors to test the clean curbs model for residential waste on a small scale, potentially the first in a series of pilots that will inform our future planning. Next month, we will unveil a pilot network of smart bins, unstaffed and automated food scrap drop-off bins controlled with either a smartphone or RFID card. These hold the promise of an expanded network of drop-off sites in parts of the city not yet served by curbside composting. Also next month, we will promulgate final rules requiring large residential buildings to develop a waste management plan for review by DSNY when submitting their building permit application to the Department of Buildings. Refuse is delivered to one of eight export facilities, rail or marine transfer stations that containerize the waste in sealed shipping containers for transport to disposal facilities upstate or in other states on the East Coast. These facilities developed as part of our 20 year comprehensive solid waste management plan reflect a shift away from refuse export by long haul truck and a commitment to borrow equity in managing garbage. After the closure of the Fresh Kills landfill, almost all of New York City's refuse was exported by long haul truck from privately operated transfer stations. Because of the city's zoning and siting restrictions, these private transfer stations are predominantly located in three neighborhoods in North Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, and South Bronx. The rail and barge based transfer stations built by DSNY as part of the solid waste management plan have dramatically reduced truck traffic associated with refuse collection and hauling in these historically overburdened communities. Together, these new facilities, along with the use of an existing energy to, from waste facility in New Jersey, make up a resilient and reliable network to export refuse. They also have allowed the city to permanently reduce the permanent capacity of transfer stations in historically overburdened communities. In total, the solid waste management plan has reduced truck traffic associated with waste export by more than 60 million miles per year, including more than 5 million miles in and around New York City and slash greenhouse gas emissions by 34,000 tons annually. In 2015, the city established a goal of sending zero waste to landfills, building off the department's robust curbside recycling program and several other diversion programs. In the last eight years, DSNY has built the foundational programs, policies, and critical technical support and community engagement approaches to move towards that goal. However, as we have discussed in the past, the COVID-19 pandemic had disrupted our steady progress, and we are working to restore and expand programs to get back on track towards this goal. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions from solid waste involves reducing the volume of waste generated, collected, and beneficially using food and yard waste and increased reuse and recycling remaining materials. 
To achieve our zero waste goal, the department will continue to evolve our current diversion programs while advancing new, improved and expanded programs that target recyclables, organics, textiles and electronics, household items and other non-recyclable waste. We will do this in close partnership with other city agencies to ensure policy and programmatic alignment with waste management in the context of the city's built environment and public spaces. Collections of traditional recycling, metal glass and plastic, and cartons and commingled paper and cardboard have increased from 548,000 tons in FY 2014 to 686,000 tons in FY 2021, an increase of more than 25%. As a result of substantial investment in processing infrastructure in New York City, including at the Sims Recycling Facility in Sunset Park and the Pratt Paper Mill on Staten Island, we have the capacity to take on and recycle even more material moving forward and to adapt to the changing composition of our recycling stream. Long-term contracts with local processing facility contracts have insulated New York City from the worst impact impacts of market disruptions and international trade restrictions that have forced some other municipalities to curtail or suspend their, their recycling programs. Organic waste, including food scraps and yard waste, is the most significant contributor to waste-related greenhouse gas emissions and is also the largest fraction of New York City's waste stream, one third in total. This material represents a significant opportunity to reduce emissions from landfill waste by diverting this material for beneficial use and carbon capture, including composting and anaerobic digestion and in the case specifically of food waste to minimize it at the source. Over the last decade, DSNY has grown to be a national leader in providing drop-off opportunities to compost food scraps. Earlier this month, we expanded the program to more than 200 sites citywide, the largest in the program's history, including at least one in every community board. As I mentioned earlier, we are also working to pilot smart bins to expand access to drop-off composting in neighborhoods without curbside collection. Last month, DSNY restarted curbside compost collection, which had been suspended last year to the, due to the fiscal crisis. This new iteration of the program allows buildings and residents to sign up and express interest in receiving weekly curbside compost service. Enrollment opened in August and we have received more than 51,000 unique signups to date, representing over 36,000 addresses that hold 900,000 households. We currently offer service to residents in Brooklyn Community Board 6, and we will add six additional districts at the beginning of December. Manhattan Community Boards 6 and 7, Brooklyn Community Boards 1, 2, and 7, and Bronx Community Board 8. We plan to add additional districts to the program in spring as resources permit. The department has also dramatically expanded non-curbside services to promote reuse and recycling and other products, including Donate NYC, Refashion NYC, and eCycle e NYC programs. In 2014, these programs since 2014, these programs have diverted more than 400,000 tons of waste for reuse or recycling. Today, free on-call apartment building pickups are provided to more than 922,000 households for electronic recycling and more than 200,000 households and hundreds of commercial and institutional facilities for textile reuse. And these programs continue to grow. In addition, the department, in partnership with the City Council, has taken steps to reduce the most problematic types of waste particularly single-use plastics. The department has implemented bans on food service foam products and plastic bags, along with a fee on paper bags. And we are currently working to implement the legislation to reduce the use of plastic straws and stirrers, which went into effect two weeks ago. We look forward to working with city council to enact and implement additional policies to reduce the use of hard to recycle and single-use products in favor of reusable, recyclable, and compostable alternatives. Diversion rates vary widely by community boards, but over the past eight years, the number of community boards with a less than 10% diversion rate has decreased from 12 in FY13 down to two in FY21. During this period, technical assistance provided by DSNY and its partners to building management companies, schools, NYCHA and agency facilities has shown to be an important tool to increase capacity and apply best practices to separate recyclables for DSNY collection. The city's commercial waste system has also seen advancements during this administration. Commercial waste is collected by private carters that are licensed and registered by the Business Integrity Commission and is disposed of at private transfer stations permitted by the department and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. The city embarked on a comprehensive reform of this commercial waste management system, 
first with the waste equity law enacted in partnership with city council in 2018 and commercial waste zones, which we announced major progress on earlier this morning. In August 2018, the city council passed and Mayor de Blasio signed local law 152, also known as the waste equity law. This law required the department to reduce permanent capacity of private transfer stations in four designated community districts historically overburdened by waste management trucks and infrastructure. The department implemented these reductions from October 2019 through September 2020. In total, DSNY reduced private transfer station capacity by more than 10,000 tons in these four districts, dramatically reducing the amount of waste that can pass through them. This will encourage a shift towards more fair and equitable distribution of waste management infrastructure in New York City. The total amount of waste handled at private transfer station in New York City decreased from an average of 19,100 tons per day in calendar year 2019 to 15,912 tons per day in calendar year 2020. While some portion of this decrease is attributable to the permitted capacity reductions imposed on, under local law 152, it is also likely that a greater share of the decrease is attributable to the disruption in the commercial waste stream uh, associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. The department will continue to assess the impacts of this law on flows of commercial waste as the city continues to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2019, May DePazio signed Local Law 199, requiring the establishment of commercial waste zones throughout New York City. The result of years of planning, analysis, and stakeholder engagement, the Commercial Waste Zone Program will create a safe and efficient commercial waste collection system that advances the city's climate and zero waste goals while providing high quality, low cost service to New York City businesses. The department began the competitive procurement process by issuing part one of the request for proposals in November, 2020. Part one of the RFP requested information regarding specific business character, financial and licensing requirements. Part two of the RFP was released earlier today and requests the proposed plans related to zero waste, operations, waste management, health and safety and customer service, as well as pricing. The department also promulgated several rules implementing the program, including rules governing customer service, operations, health and safety, recycling and organics collection, and other administrative requirements. After considering extensive public comments and testimony, the department published final rules covering these areas in the city record earlier today. We expect the transition period of the new zone system to begin in 2022 and last up to two years. In fiscal year 22 budget, provides 4 million in funding for support and implementation of commercial waste zones. This includes funding for 28 new civilian staff, including sev several already on board or not or scheduled to start in the coming weeks. It also includes OTPS funds for implementation, support, communications, outreach, and IT systems. And DSNY is fully resourced to pursue this important program. We look forward to working with the city council and all stakeholders as we advance this important program to bring much needed reform to the city's commercial waste sector. Our work on these important topics is far from done. We continue to expand and hone our programs, invest in new technology and infrastructure, and work to improve the effectiveness, equity, and sustainability of our waste management systems. The department is currently planning for an updated waste characterization study due to be released in early 2024, which will inform the planning of our up updated comprehensive solid waste management plan in 2026. And we are providing input to the expansion of state and federal policies that can unlock critical investment to further expand our sustainable waste management efforts, such as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act signed into law by President Biden yesterday, and the New York State's growing portfolio of expanded producer responsibility laws which increase investment in critical waste management capacity and provide financial support for the critical role municipalities play in sustainable waste management services. We are pleased to discuss these topics with you today and continue these conversations in the future with a broad set of stakeholders, including the incoming members of the city council. And we look forward to working with the incoming administration and our partner agencies in the 2023 update to Plan NYC and One NYC, the city's strategic sustainability blueprints. In closing, I want to once again thank Chair Reynoso and all the members of this committee for your continued support. You are critical advocates as we work to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean, and ensure long-term sustainability in our communities. And we are grateful for your commitment. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning, and my staff and I are now happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, 
please stay unmuted if all of the DSNY panelists could please stay unmuted during the question and answer period. We will now turn it over to questions from Chair Reynoso. Chair. Thank you so much. And I just want to also acknowledge the work. Um, I don't know if folks read the committee report and that's uh, Andres in the background, so I apologize for that. Um, but I don't know if you guys have read the committee report, but the work that was done um, by the staff here in the city council to really sum up the work that we did before, during, and after um, it, it is, is incredible. Um, arguably one of the best written reports we've had in, a, in quite some time. They're all great, but this one was very special. So I just want to shout out Nadia Johnson, uh, Ricky Chuala, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, um, and Jessica Steinberg Albin, who's with us right now as a committee counsel, also um, to Terza Nasser, um, the work that um, they've done in the infrastructure division, and of course, Jeff Baker, that runs uh, pretty much the whole show. So I just want to thank everybody on the council side for this amazing report. Um, I know many times they don't feel people read them or see them, uh, but uh, they are very thorough and great reports uh, that are put out all the time by the staff. So thank you for that work. Um, I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Brennan, uh, Councilmember Feliz, uh, and Councilmember Gennaro. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, all folks that we hope are here long term uh, in this committee uh, and are continuing to affect change uh, in a meaningful way. Um, and now let me just get to, to the questions. So can we... Um, the, the commercial way zones, you know, it took a long time for us to get to, to where we were. Um, and I think a lot of people are just asking, like, um, because of COVID and how things have turned out, you know, the need for delays and uh, just where are we with the commercial way zones? What can we expect? Uh, is there an internal timeline that can really give us a better sense um, to communicate to businesses and our, and our communities um, exactly where we stand with, uh, with uh, Local Law 199 and the commercial way zones? Good morning, Chair. Thank you for the question. Yes, we're very happy that we were able to uh, continue the progress on commercial waste zones um, and really have our part one of the RFP was such an engaging process where we were we went out of our way to make sure that we spent extra time talking to all the respondents who, you know, wanted to express interest to get them ready to part for part two, which was the way more technical and way more involved part of the RFP. And we're thrilled to have released you know, the rules in the second half today. Um, for a little bit more granularity on the, the current timeline, I'm going to let Deputy Commissioner Greg Anderson step in and give you exactly where we stand today. But this is exciting. This is one of the best bills that this council has put forward and passed. And uh, we're very happy that we got into part two. So Greg, please give everybody an update on our timeline. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and thank you, Chair Reynoso, for, for holding this hearing. Um, it's been great working with you and, and the entire committee um, over the last eight years. So uh, as the Commissioner mentioned, we released part two of the RFP uh, just this morning, actually around an hour ago it went out. Um, so we're, we're very excited about that. Um, as the Commissioner mentioned, that's the bulk of what we're asking for from the respondents, includes the price proposals, as well as their plans for zero waste operations, waste management, health and safety, customer service, Etc. cetera. Um, those are due back uh, in March of 2022. And we anticipate it'll take us a little bit of time to get through all the responses. These are very uh, detailed responses because they, they will shape the future of this industry over the next um, several decades. Um, and we are optimistic that we'll be able to begin the customer transition uh, by the end of calendar year 2022. So about a year delayed from where we had originally hoped to be when we were, when we, um, worked with the council to pass local law 199 uh, two years ago. Um, and actually coming up on, I think in, in just three days, the two year anniversary of the signing of that bill. Um, but, uh, you know, I think important that we took the time to do this right um, and to understand the impact that COVID-19 had on the commercial waste industry and, and sort of allow them to get back on their feet before proceeding. Yeah, Deputy Commissioner, can you expand on that just a bit? Um, uh, Part one, how was the response? Um, a lot of folks are concerned about the fact that COVID and the pandemic have put us in a position where we might be seeing increased prices or that the RFPs, what we'll get back relating to pricing, it's not gonna be ideal. Um, and you know, I, I made a commitment to do everything I can to make sure the prices were as equal to what they are now or less. 
um, even though we're implementing a much more complicated, uh, much more expansive system, which a lot more requirements. So while I know that I might be um, uh, very optimistic about the outcomes, um, the pandemic does concern me. Um, and I don't know if we're gonna get prices that we might have to lock in for a significant amount of time that are more reflective of the moment than it is of the standard. So I just wanna know um, if you guys can give us an update and I guess part two is where we're gonna see a lot of that. But what is your projection, I guess, related to how COVID impacted, um, the, could impact the outcomes of, of the RFP? Yeah, so I, th I think there's there's a, a, few, a few different answers to that question. Um, the first is that the way that we've designed the program uh, doesn't actually lock in prices over the long term. All that we're doing is locking in maximum prices. And so at any point, customers and carters still have the ability to negotiate the rate that the customer is paying to the carter um, the same way that they can now. So you can go out to the three carters that service your zone, say, hey, I want to get my, um, my refuse and recycling picked up three times a week. What, what's the best price you can give me? Um, and all three carters can come back and say, you know, here's the best price on a monthly basis that I can offer you for that service. Um, so there is still a level of competition in the system. Um, the second is, you know, I, I do think that that obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has had a lot of impacts on um, on our economy, on pricing, on the, the availability of drivers, for example. That's something that I think we, we're seeing nationwide. Um, what we're also seeing is that companies like UPS, for example, that treat their drivers really well don't have driver shortages. So, you know, it's possible that companies in this market that treat their drivers really well Will continue to you know be able to operate and, and offer competitive pricing um, and in the same way that we're seeing some costs increase we're also seeing incredibly robust recycling markets right now um, at levels that we haven't seen in several years um, we've seen uh, prices for uh, recycled commodities recover from uh, the impacts of of some of the previous uh, market disruptions the national sword program in china so i think there's a lot of different factors and the program is is created to adapt to those um, changing economic factors and, and really allow businesses make the, the smart choice and the right choice uh, for them. Um, that, that's good. Good to know. Um, yeah, just, uh, just concerning. Um, I, I got a couple of calls from some folks in, the, um, in businesses, small businesses that are very concerned um, over the prices that they might be getting because of COVID. Um, and they also have uh, uncertainty on their end. They don't know how much waste they're going to be having on a regular basis. Uh, just a lot of flexibility is going to be needed. I'm hoping that whoever does win these RFPs um, does their best to be a, as accommodating as possible, which is kind of why we want this to happen, right? We want the best players that have that type of flexibility to be able to do this work. Um, so we're thinking the early 2022, um, that's good. Um, you know, that's a month, a month away. Um, a month and a half away. Is that when we're thinking that the RFPs are going to come back? Um, can you just explain that a little better so that I understand? I, I just want to know when the zones are going to be there, when the trucks, when the businesses are going to be chosen, like just operationally fully functional. When, when are we thinking? Sure. So the, the part two of the RFP that was released this morning is due on March 17th, 2022, St. Patrick's Day. Mm -hmm. um, and we're uh, expecting that it'll, it'll take us several months, um, probably until early summer, to get through the review and evaluation of those proposals. Um, so then sometime late summer um, or early fall, we will make the awards and then uh, optimistically uh, start the customer transition by the end of the calendar year. So that's when, when businesses on the ground will actually start to... Um, both a hear from sanitation uh, about this program. Um, our, our goal is to have as many different touch points with every um, commercial establishment in New York City as we can, um, in person, phone, texts, emails, whatever your preferred method of communication. We wanna talk to you about this. We wanna educate you. We wanna give you the tools to make the right decision for your business. Um, and that, that process, that outreach should uh, start sometime in the fall so that uh, um, businesses have the tools they need to select their carters starting uh, by the end of the year. Okay. And, and again, we're, we're anticipating this will be a phased transition. So it will not be everyone at once. 
Um, we'll probably start with a smaller group just to make sure we understand the mechanics and, um, and that we're not biting off more that we can chew. And over the course of um, up to two years, so from 2022 through 2024, um, continue that transition process. Okay. Um, I want to allow for, uh, I have a ton of questions, um, and I wanna, but I want to allow for my fellow council members, should they have any questions to ask uh, uh, first, uh, because I'm going to be here the whole time and they might have other things they might need to do. But I just want to ask one more set of questions, um, which is uh, the waste equity legislation. Um, its impact on permitted capacity. I uh, just wanted to know if we have uh, just some numbers as to the changes uh, in each community, by community board, uh, District 1 in Brooklyn, of course, uh, Queens District 12, Bronx Community District 1, and Bronx Community Board District 2. Um, we'd love to know what the reduction, the, the actual reduction is um, in permanent capacity and whether or not uh, the numbers you're giving me are also impacted by COVID, which we could probably, I assume, see a significant reduction in commercial waste, uh, but we'd love to know like, the status of the waste equity situation. Uh, understood. Thank you, Chair. Uh, great question. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, to address just one topic, uh, it is our firm belief that the COVID impact is going to definitely be part of the transfer station capacity reduction, uh, just in the overall tonnage, because we saw what it did to the commercial sector. So that's definitely mm -hmm. going to see uh, be baked into that number. Mm -hmm. However, the permanent capacity is definitely down. Um, again, as I said in, in adjusted on the testimony as well, um, we were at about 19,000 tons per day in you know calendar year 2019, down to 15,000, almost 16,000 tons per day. Uh, and that's overall. Um, in, in all four community boards. We will yeah. definitely follow back up with you unless, and I will see if, if Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Anderson, you know, Greg has the granular stats for each community board specifically, but if we don't have it with today, I will get it to you uh, immediately following. So Greg, do you have the individual stats or should we have to yep. follow up with the council? Yeah, I, I have everything right here. Okay. Um, so in terms of the reduction in permitted capacity, um, cause, because there, there are two, two different things that we're um, looking at here. One is permanent capacity, which is the amount of waste that the transfer stations are allowed to take. Um, the total reduction in permitted capacity citywide was uh, 10,127 tons per day. Um, in those four districts, the greatest reduction was in Brooklyn Community District 1, 7,700 uh, 7, tons, or a 36% overall reduction in capacity. In that district, um, in Bronx one, 898 tons per day reduction, 13% reduction. Um, Bronx two, uh, 1,457 tons per day. That's a 30% reduction. And Queens 12, 660 tons per day. That's a 29% reduction. Um, when we compare that to actual changes in throughput, and, and yeah. there is a big disclaimer here, as the commissioner mentioned, the, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on commercial waste throughput was huge. Um, the decrease between uh, 2019 and 2020 um, was a, a big change, um, about 25% reduction overall in commercial waste throughput at these, at these private transfer stations. And uh, particularly just from quarter one to quarter two, uh, an absolutely uh, massive change. And all of this information is in our local L-152 report uh, that we also released this morning. Uh, so big, big dump of information uh, ahead of this hearing, trying to get everything out um, for public consumption. Um, so I think, you know, we can uh, certainly share that with, with all the members of the committee and you can look through that. If you want to talk through any of the, the specifics of, of particular districts or transfer stations, we're happy to do that in the future. Yeah, no, no, we know that the permitted capacity was shut down. I just wanted to know what the actual returns were and throughput, but you're right at this point, very hard to gauge um, considering COVID. Um, so I'm gonna, my next set of questions are gonna be related to containerized waste, organics, um, and just the expansion of everything else that needs to happen to get to zero waste, including the study for save as you throw. Um, but I wanna turn it over to my colleagues, please colleagues, um, raise your hands and the uh, committee council will call on you um, when, when she sees you. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on the council members to ask their questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. 
Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your questions. First, we will hear from Council Member Chen. Time Council starts now. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair, for your leadership on this committee. And uh, you know, thank you to uh, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner uh, for all your partnership. Um, you know, I signed up for this committee this term because I want to make sure that the commercial waste zone management system get passed. I mean, that was my uh, reason for joining this committee. Uh, even though I worked on, you know, on also on the the plastic bag ban and and all those other issues. So on the commercial waste zone. Um, I wanted to make sure that the priorities are set in some of those specific areas. And we've been pushing to make sure that lower Manhattan, um, you know, get the priority for the commercial waste zone, especially in areas like Soho, uh, Chinatown, because there's so many small businesses and there's so many private Carter company uh, that exists in those areas. And the complaints that we hear constantly is that those commercial waste trucks just keeps on coming. Uh, and it doesn't really make sense to have so many different companies coming down one street. Um, like for example, Stone Street in Lower Manhattan. I mean, like one company could just take care of the whole block. But in reality, there are more than that. That's one question. The other one is uh, I really am interested in how effective is the, uh, is the tax on the uh, paper bag uh, in terms of uh, the plastic bag uh, ban that, that went into effect. Uh, like how, like, was there like decrease in tonnage uh, of plastic uh, band, you know, a bag's collection and also like how much uh, fees were we were able to generate uh, from this collection. I know that the sanitation department, you know, utilized resources to even produce more of the reusable bag and we see those orange bags everywhere. And I, my office, we give them out in every public event that we give to and, and people really utilize uh, those bags. So I really wanna see how um, successful that is. And my third question is, Commissioner, what you will testify, you talk about really looking at more efficient uh, residential garbage collection uh, in terms of utilizing the street versus a sidewalk. And examples like in Lowe Manhattan, I mean, every time I walk by during sanitation pickup day, the, set, the garbage comes out very early and they takes out takes up more than half the sidewalk and they piled up real high taller than me and it's just like there's so much garbage and there's no walking you know walkable space uh, so I'm really interested in hearing how um, you know you can implement that like utilizing some of the parking space uh, for the garbage so that we could free up sidewalk space for pedestrians especially in low Manhattan where the sidewalks are so narrow and you have a lot of pedestrians because of all the you know, businesses and the retail, I mean, all the office space. It's really uh, very difficult for you know, mothers with baby carriage to go to stroll by because it's just no more sidewalk space. So the, yeah, those are my three questions. Well, thank you so much, Councilwoman. And we appreciate all the work we've been able to do together. Um, first and foremost, let me address the commercial waste zones. You couldn't have said it any better. Um, that's what. That's why this legislation was so important. And that's why making sure that we get through the, the second part of the RFP and we take the time to do it correctly and review all the submissions and make sure that these zones, when implemented, we can have a strong outreach campaign and make sure that all the small businesses in Lower Manhattan and all the impacted areas um, know exactly what's expected of them, how they can you know, make their arrangements with their new Carter who will, will have been awarded in, inside the zone. And then once we have that in place, you're going to clearly see a, dip, a, a reduction in the amount of trucks that are traversing through. It's that's the entire beauty of what it was mm -hmm. designed to do, and that's exactly where it's going to go. As far as uh, where we're going first, we're going to have it go in with the submissions. We totally understand all the high density areas, particularly Lower Manhattan, but we're going to make sure that the submissions are correct. Um, and make sure that the, the vendors that, that have submitted their second, their responses know what's expected of them. And we look to definitely have that moving towards that end of the year FY22 goal uh, that my colleague had mentioned earlier. As far as uh, the 
hopefully getting more um, set outs or expanding the proposals for what is a clean curbs model, which is taking set outs off the curb and putting it into potential parking spaces. We're very excited to where we get to work with all the stakeholders, including the local community, our partners at DOT and traffic management. We want to make sure that when we propose these solutions and evaluate how effective they are, that they are in fact making the, a problem go away. So the first step is going to be is to find out where to place these bins or containers and who's gonna manage them, work together locally at the on the street level with where these fire. bins are going to be hosted and then making sure that it's not creating a problem and creating a solution because that's the main goal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, as far as, um, what was your last question? I'm sorry, you had three. Um, oh, the plastic bags. Yes, right? the plastic <laughs> bags. Well, actually, this is great legislation. And because it's film bag, I'm not going to say that there's no dramatic impact on tonnage, but it is definitely impacting on behavior. And we there is definitely a financial outcome in that. And I'm going to let Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson give you some stats on that. But it is more important to see the people's behavior change. And you nailed it. Seeing those orange bags out there everywhere, that's a beautiful sight to see. I don't know that you're always going to see a dramatic decrease in immediate tonnage year over year, but we're definitely seeing the behavior and that we'll take that to start. But Commissioner Anderson, you want to give us some stats on the dollar figures? Sure. Yeah. I, the good news is uh, there's revenue coming in. So the state collects the, the revenue from the paper bag fees and a portion of that comes back to New York City. So we have already realized uh, significant money. Uh, in December 2020, for example, uh, $473,000 came back to us, and that was just one portion of one year. And we are using that to pay for those orange bags. We're using that to pay for the distribution of bags, reusable bags, um, in as many targeted outreach opportunities as we can, and as many um, broad opportunities as we can. Uh, so we're very excited about the, the revenue that's coming in. It's, it's helping us pay for the reusable solution. Um, and uh, we're actually making sure that we continue to procure bags so we have plenty to, to provide New Yorkers because we know we haven't hit everybody. Um, as far as understanding the impact of the plastic bag ban, we are conducting our next waste characterization study starting next summer. So we will have new updated data citywide about um, how many plastic shopping bags are in the waste stream. And so we're looking forward to, I anticipate we will see a significant reduction uh, but we won't know that until we've conducted that study. Uh, I will say there's one interesting uh, thing that's happening, and some of you may have noticed this, where um, paper bags were the assumed alternative product, but there are also these alternative uh, sort of woven bags that are, uh, they're maybe reusable to a certain degree, but not reusable mm -hmm. 100 per 100 washes. Um, stores we have seen charging, you know, they are allowed to charge for bags and, you know, as much as they mm -hmm. want, they have to charge five cents. Um, and so we're working with the state to understand whether or not if there's a non-paper bag alternative that's being uh, given out and charged, is that is there any money that can be recouped from that as well? So mm -hmm. uh, we do see uh, huge improvements. I think litter reduction is, is one of the biggest benefits of reducing plastic bags. Um, and like I said, we'll see the tonnages once we conduct that study. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. And I just wanna say that the plastic bag work was absolutely amazing. Another long, what I thought was an unnecessary fight um, and to see the outcomes of this work. And I always go back to like New York exceptionalism on a lot of these things. These things that seem very tough from the outside looking in, um, New York is always ready. They're always ready. We are arguably one of the most resilient people in this entire country. Um, there's no task that we won't set out for that we won't succeed in. And the plastic bag stuff was like a perfect example of that. All that fighting to now see, you know, every time I go into the bodega or I go into a supermarket, someone's carrying a bag um, of some sort uh, is absolutely remarkable. And I think, you know, of the achievements that we were able to accomplish in this committee, that was one of the the, the, the bigger ones and the highlights of this committee. So I just want to say thank you so much, Councilmember Chen, for like your advocacy on that and for being on the committee and supporting Commercial Way Zone. We needed every vote. So thank you for being here. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I want to, uh, committee council, um, calling on the next council members. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, next, we will call on Council Member Riley. Time starts now. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you also to Commissioner Grayson uh, for your hard work. Uh, your men and women have been doing amazing work um, in the northeast section of the Bronx. Uh, my concern comes again um, about the rats. Um, that's kind of infesting our communities. Uh, the other day, I was actually uh, driving uh, down my block, and there was a hawk um, that actually captured a rat and was actually eating the rat right in front of my neighbor's um, like driveway. Um, I know this is like a, a real uh, issue amongst New Yorkers that we're seeing rats going to playgrounds, um, climbing into trash cans and things of that nature. And we do understand, I believe, last uh, hearing you did mention the fact that the way that we... Um, put out our garbage. A lot of New Yorkers uh, put out their garbage, um, not in the garbage pan. So do you feel like any legislation to kind of, you know, uh, push New Yorkers to kind of um, distribute, I mean, put their garbage out um, in bins or, or garbage cans will kind of uh, limit the amount of rats that we're kind of seeing in our community? Um, that's really just my concern today, just how we are addressing this rat issue. Thank you, Councilman. And yes, I, I do believe that when you have, we set out, most residents are setting out their refuse at the curb. And I think that, that one of the main goals uh, that we have as a department in working with council, working with the next administration and continuing onward is figuring out a way to have curbside organics. And I think that right now, the last iteration that we had with the program was in a sealed brown bin for all the residential units. And yeah. we were still working uh, to figure out what would be the high rise solutions um, and figuring out the containers that would host that or the other methods of collection that would host that as far as the large scale buildings. And I think that right now, uh, that is one part of the future of where we can go to reduce the amount of curbs set out to reduce accessibility to food source for rodents. So I think that as we continue to expand curbside collection of organics and set out separation, that's a good way. I still would encourage any neighborhood to consider whether or not, and especially it's harder in the big buildings where storage is an issue, um, to potentially switch to a can. Even though we give out the brown bin with the snap, wheel, with the snap seal and it's very you know, uh, safe and, and it's hard for rodents to get into it, any regular can can also do, you know, be preventative in a certain way. And I think that if, you know, in any area where you have higher uh, sightings of rats, um, that I think that that might be something to, to talk about, especially in those neighborhoods to say, hey, look, maybe you want to go to a container as opposed to bag set out. There are also plenty of parts of New York City that bag set out is perfectly okay. And the rat sightings aren't as high. And it's really, you know, neighborhood specific and density specific, I would, I would say. Um, as far as definitely what I, what I do want to circle back with you on after this, and we will reach out to your offices, I want to make sure that you know we know exactly where we're talking, where we're seeing all the high sightings, so that we're doing all I can on as far as spillage or any residual cleaning. If there's something else we could do locally to work with you, compounded with teaming up with DOHMH, who does the mitigation programs on the rat trappings, because I think that there is definitely, I can't, I mean, look, uh, I'm a lifelong New Yorker, rats are a reality, but we can certainly do all we can, um, and I want to make sure that we're meeting that uh, head on. But I do believe that you know, uh, encouraging can use or container use where it, where we're certainly having that problem is going to definitely shift the way the rodents behave just by eliminating accessibility to food source. And one of the ways that we were on the path to do prior to the setbacks of the COVID-19 pandemic was definitely with the curbside organic program and expanding that. We had these lovely bins that were out and was taking some of the most attractive food sources, so to speak, to rodents and putting it into a sealed bin for us to collect. So I think that that's something moving forward that we could all work towards. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Barani. And um, Commissioner, I just want to talk about some progress. You know, I, I feel like shouldn't have to come from you know, legislation. I just feel like there's internal policy that could be created by the Department of Sanitation that could help solve for these problems. The rat issue is 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 quickly, you know, whether it's anecdotal or however we want to see it, it's just see, it seems to be an increase that we're getting a lot of calls about in our in our in our districts. Um, containerized waste. Um, why is that not something that you encourage or that the administration does outside of having um, the city council, you know, force your hand on something that I think we agree on? Right. I always say that one of the biggest concerns I've had with the administration is that we have to drag him to get to a place where he wants to be. Right. Like it's just it's, it's like taking a kid to a park, but you got to drag him there. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, you want to be there. You know, it makes a lot of sense. Containerized waste is done in every other large like developed city. 
Um, you know, it's just, it's, we're just so outdated putting our trash in front of our homes. Why not just let the administration move forward with some type of process that gets us there instead of having to wait for us to write legislation for it? Um, I think that I think that the there's a there's a there's a couple of different facets to that question, and I totally appreciate the concept. I think that you know New Yorkers for a very long time have been you know whether they want to understand it or not, and excuse the pun, they put out their set out you know in the Burger King model. It's however they can get it out. So it's the building owners can put it out. Sometimes they choose bags or sometimes they choose cans. And it really comes into storage and feasibility of storage. And this leads back into, you know, literally the behavior from the kitchen to the curb in every household in the city. If you have a place to store it, you'll buy storage bins and keep it there. And if you don't have a place to store it, you're going to rely on whatever the incumbent building infrastructure is where you live in uh, to store it until the collection day. I think that uh, containerized or having a specifically sealed set out location is something that definitely has to be looked at uh, throughout every block of, of New York City if it's if it's feasible and to be hosted upon because it does take away parking spaces and also uh, adds to a question of ownership or stewardship so to speak because while everyone would agree that maybe a sealed container would be better uh, for where you would set out waste I don't know that everybody would agree where exactly that container is located being someone who tries to cite sanitation facilities all the time and with your partnership and you've been help, trying to help us you'll agree that people want something want something to be done with garbage as long as it's not in front of their house so it's an interesting concept that that's why committees like this and conversations like this where we can exchange good ideas you're 100 right chair there is definitely a better way to you know do set outs and talk about that. But I think that it's a far reaching conversation that you have to, because one thing that we can all be sure of is that New York City has never been something that can be painted with one brush. And I think that having a committee like this do such great work over the past eight years under your leadership, and even prior, this committee being founded to figure out what the waste stream and the waste stream management for the city from its entire you know, inception is something that's amazing. And I look forward to where we can have those conversations. So net, do I think that containerized collection is a way to look at? Absolutely. I'm very excited about these RFPs that are coming out. I'm very excited to look and, and see how it could be done, not only on the commercial sector, but in the residential sector. And I don't think that we have to wait for everything, but I do think that we need to understand more as an agency. Because one thing I can tell you, we have not been servicing in uh, a centrally located pen on regular residential blocks. I can tell you now that for years, we have collected from centrally located pens inside NYCHA campuses and other big buildings, and it does have its advantageous policy there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it, though, takes a lot of real estate, and that's one of the biggest things that is our obstacle. Everything that involves managing the waste stream requires a commitment of real estate, whether it be inside on the curb or on side the campus or inside the existing property line. And it's trying to meet those challenges head on and giving people the awareness that we're we're completely cognizant of the real estate challenges and some of the existing building infrastructure challenges, particularly in the high rise, where you're struggling to make sure that you have living space and also waste management space and trying to make sure everybody's educated to know this is what you need to do to manage a waste stream well. And more importantly, how we as the department could evolve with that so that we're giving efficient curbside collection and or efficient containerized collection. And I really do think you're onto something and I don't, and I'm not saying that just because it's you, there's something there, but it's definitely gonna take a lot more work and a lot more conversations as we move forward. I hear you. And look, I hear you on, on how complicated these things can be, but, and I say this all the time, it's just, it's a matter of like re reestablishing culture, reestablishing, you know, what this, what, trash is for this city um and uh, an example of things people don't like that they are forced to do and now and, and never fight it's trees in front of their properties people don't like trees in front of their properties and the department of parks and the city of new york says deal with it too bad because it's not about you it's about the greater good and another thing is that trees are put inside in in uh, sidewalks commissioner sidewalks not on streets where they're taking up parking spaces on sidewalks where people that are handicapped people with strollers are taking away from pedestrian space when we're supposed to be prioritizing pedestrians over over everything right pedestrians are supposed to be the number one and the pedestrians and homeowners sacrifice their space uh, for the greater good um and i am a, a a giver of medicine commissioner um you may not like it but it's good for you and uh i will be fighting as the the borough president to make sure 
that this is something that gets accomplished sooner rather than later. Because we're going to solve for better. Not only is it better for you guys, it's more efficient for the, the workers. The workers might not have to like the, 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 the tax on their bodies would go down if it's containerized waste. And maybe we have trucks that could like pop it up. I don't know what, you know, what we need to do. Um, but there's way it saves on time. And it also solves the rat issue. The rat issue in this city is not about anything more than the fact that they have access, accessible to them food, very high quality food. We're the food capital of the world. Um, these rats are eating good food. Um, and the way we get rid of it is by hiding it, making sure we lock it up the same way we were locking it up with organics. We can do that. And containerized waste is the future. And I want to give people their medicine. I want to take away their parking spots. And I want to put in containers. And it might be in front of your house. I mean, maybe we do something. We lower your taxes in front of the houses that take it. We'll, we can figure out a way to incentivize people to want to do it. But we that's what we are. New York, we're exceptional. We figure it out. And then we do it. We just do it. And I hope that um, I don't want it to be. I guess what I don't want it to be is legislation. I want the mayor of the city of New York to just say, hey, this is the wave of the future. You know, let, let's just start getting to work on exactly how that happens. And I know that this team that you have is more than ready, willing, and able to figure that out. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but I just want to say trees is a perfect example. Nobody asks anybody about trees. They just get put right in front of your house and you just take it. And I got a tree pit in front of mine. I'm, I'm, I'm a renter and I got a tree pit in front of mine and it is the, the bane of my existence. The amount of cleaning I have to do for that um, is it, something else. Um, but I uh, just wanted to say that containerized waste is something that's important to me. Uh, another thing that's important to me is organic, organic recycling, organics recycling. Commissioner, it, hurt, it hurts me to my soul, to my soul, this, this half, half, half system, half step system that we have in place right now in the city of New York to handle organic waste. Um, it was my pride and joy, even as a pilot program, that we had uh, organics recycling in these neighborhoods. I um, mean, to see that go away, um, you know, and I thought like COVID was more of an excuse to take it away than it was um, a reality of the need to take it away. Uh, but can we just talk about organics? Um, it is initially expensive, as some things are, right? You'd spend money up front in hopes that you save money later on. But what's more expensive is the impacts that organic waste has on our city, on our future. Though that is that is incalculable, that's the word, um, uh, and things that we can't solve for long term because we're not doing the work today. We don't spend the million here, we're gonna spend the 10 million in 10 years. So I just wanna have a conversation about what, what if any conversations are being had about organic waste in this administration in the last month and a half um, and whether or not it's been a priority uh, for the mayor. Um, for this group here, trust me, I know everyone here very well. I know they care deeply about this stuff. So I'm not asking you, you know, or I'm not asking the team, the deputy commissioners, but in this administration, is that something you guys are talking about? It's a great question. And yes, um, you know, we are very excited uh, and we've been working with the administration and on the expansion of the next six districts that come in December on the current opt-in program. This is another opportunity for us to expand into more community boards throughout the city for what is a valuable program for us because what we, the, the communication cycle that we have with all of those who've expressed interest and we've been able to, for the first time ever, really have a direct line of communication with everybody who has signed up um, and letting them know that you know this is your collection day. Please make sure you have your bin out. Please make sure you're participating. And in the month of October, it is excellent that we were able to divert over 40 tons of organic material in one community board. So, you know, when you think about it, this is exactly where we need to be um, as we build steps. The other sob side of the current way that we're doing this, you know, reintroduction of the program is by seeing these expressions of interest and trying to understand, you know, the behavior change that's going to be needed globally. You know, you spoke before about medicine and, and doing things because they're right. And it is undeniable that tackling the organics waste stream and making it a mandatory citywide program is the only way we're ever gonna really put a dent into our zero waste goal. We need that. Um, we said that before, we spoke about it at the last hearing, we spoke about it almost a year ago. Um, this is exactly where 
we need to tackle. And it is through your leadership, through the partnership in the council and this committee, but working with the administration, um, you know, we really took that cannon hole with the COVID-19, uh, you know, pandemic and what happened to us on the budget. And we had to retrench and, and we need to now build back in this incredible time in New York City where people have gone through some of the most adaptive change we've ever seen in the last, you know, 19 months. Look what we're doing. People's behavior change factions of every the way they're living their everyday lives have really taken a step forward. Now, more than ever, we have this amazing opportunity to continue to build towards changing people's behavior. What is going to be the right cocktail? I cannot wait to see where we go from here. Um, we're going to learn a lot from this current program as we get through the end of this fiscal year and into next calendar year, working with the new administration, have some things to talk about, about the, the relatable behavior change we've seen just in all those who opted in, looking to expand and knowing exactly who didn't opt in to target another thing that you have been a big champion for this council and this committee has been a big champion for, which is a more robust communication strategy. I think that that in the end, what we're going to need is to implement one of the biggest outreach campaigns ever to get people to change their behavior coupled with i mean we're talking we need to be out there in full force to be able to roll something out throughout the whole entire city i think that organics waste is exactly how we do it i think we have to work together to solve some of the other unknowns which is what is the high-rise solution what is the high density solution and if that is some of the new programs and the new accessibility points and the new touch points that we can have with expanded, you know, local networks and the 200 plus food scrap drop off providers. Uh, we're very excited to see the use and buy in that we're going to get from this smart bin program. I mean, this would give us a way that you could have again tailor made uh, bins that are going to only allow people who wave their smartphone in front of it or the RFID card that they're provided access. This is people who are buying into living a sustainable life and providing access to that with then collection service from DSNY to make sure that the back end of that product goes exactly to where it wants to be and gets diverted properly. So I think that where are we in composting? I think that we're at the beginnings of where we go next. And I think that we have uh, a lot to commit to. Um, you know, we talk about the term and I know that it's something zero by 30. Uh, we have already stated uh, the last time we were all together in this caucus that zero by 30 probably is shaky. Um, but that doesn't mean it's undoable. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that we can't as a city come together and do some incredible behavior change that we can't as a city come together and make all the constituents know where the accessibility is, how they can make really good choices. How do we expand and get more households and more high rise buildings on the textile program and the e-cycle program and the, you know, expanding opportunities to donate. And I think that we are ripe for some incredible behavior change from for, for some incredible leaps forward. And I think that there will be an entire caucus of stakeholders that have to be involved, including the partners that we have, partner agencies, community-based organizations, this council, the next administration, the waste industry, as we all look to solve what happens. We are really excited about what we can get out of the, and learn about the changes in the waste stream that have come post-pandemic in our next waste characterization study. The, that study, we are trying to do we can, we're working with the administration to try to come up with the most robust study that we can come up with so we can see all the nuances because if we don't know what's in the waste stream dynamically, it's going to be very hard to plan the long term recycling goals without knowing exactly what the current makeup is. And then as we do that by neighborhood, by community board, as we look at that strata data that comes in, we can plan the communication strategy. And more importantly, we are just a short time away from the next iteration of the solid waste management plan due in 2026. That critical information about what's happening inside each black bag, what is happening in every household from the kitchen to the curb, so to speak, we need to understand what that is. We need to understand how to best communicate through this rich, beautiful, diverse culture that we have throughout all New York City, make sure that everybody understands what it is so that we could all make those big changes on sustainability as we move forward. I cannot wait to work to continue working with you in your next role, but also this council. This is exactly where all this can happen. Um, do I want more organics today? Absolutely. Are we having those conversations? Yes, we're looking to expand in December with six more districts, and then more than likely in the spring with even more districts. So that work will continue. Our outreach and Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson's team going literally door to door, tabling events, trying to 
to educate everybody who signs up. That will continue. And more importantly, the conversations on to where we're going to be leading into the next fiscal year and the next budget, those are continuing as well. Well, Commissioner, I, I appreciate that. And I just hope the next mayor really allows you to, you know, loosens the reins and allows you to go and do what you know how to do. I always think we should just allow for the experts to kind of do their work. Um, you know exactly what this city needs. You've been doing this for such a long time. You have a great team around you. And I just hope that the mayor allows for experts to dictate the future of this city and these agencies. Um, because if they did, you know, you, I, you're very practical, um, hardworking folks that can really figure out how to solve for a lot of these issues. The only thing that gets in the way is politics. Politics getting in the way of being able to do real work that can make a, a meaningful difference in this city. Um, so I'm hoping that the next administration, the next council really empower you um, so you can move forward with a lot of these issues because I can't stand it that we have to stand here and you know, not fight, but discuss things that we agree on, right? Like I can't, I don't like having a discussion about things that we agree on. And the advocates are gonna talk to you. They're gonna say a few words after this and you're gonna see everything they say, you're probably gonna agree with. Um, and it's just, we can't get it done. Um, I think because of politics um, over, over policy. So I'm hoping we can get through that. Um, I, I do wanna not take too long and allow for the advocates to say a few words as well um, uh, before we have to close out. but. Just want to say um, that, uh, again, I, I want this to be about where we go moving forward. I do think containerized ways, bringing back out of the side of street parking, uh, mandatory organics um, are all things that we need to have a very serious conversation about. Um, and I'm hoping that the next administ administration and the next group of, uh, of uh, council members take it on. Um, and I just want to say to, to you all, um, Bridget Anderson, Gregory Anderson, Commissioner Grayson, I can't tell you how, how proud and great I, uh, and, and, and grateful I am um, that you guys are at the helm of this work. Uh, it, folks that don't know who these the deputy commissioners are, um, these are extraordinary people that believe, believe in the mission. Uh, and are as bright as they come. And if given the opportunity, could do amazing work here. Uh, but whether I sat on a panel with Bridget and we're going at it about, you know, pay as you throw or save as you throw, save as you throw, I don't wanna get in trouble. Um, uh, or uh, just uh, understanding, um, you know, the, the work and the data and the information that needs to be presented to the general public to get things done. Um, and the availability of uh, Commissioner Gregory Anderson as well. I can't tell you how, grateful I am to you both um, for the work that you've done. And Commissioner Grayson, um, you know, the former commissioner, you know, you know, high heels to follow. Um, and I can't tell you that you've done an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how grateful I am. You know, and I think a lot of people didn't know who you were and didn't know what to expect. Um, but you're, you know, extremely sharp, you know, from beginning to end, uh, your family and the history in sanitation. Um, you're progressive like policy wonks, uh, policy like chops uh, when it comes to a lot of this work are things that are unexpected and like highly, I'm highly grateful that you are the commissioner. And uh, this is my uh, five second pitch to the next administration that if you want to get things done, these are the people you keep, you keep around you for sure. Um, so I want to say thank you all very, very much. I can't tell you how happy I am to have chaired this committee for the last uh, uh, eight years. Um, especially with you guys on it, helping me through it. Um, and I want to allow for arguably folks that I don't think ever missed the hearing um, are these advocates that keep me, keep me censored, keep me, keep me uh, 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 on top of it, let me tell you, unwavering advocates um, like uh, Justin Wood and Eric Goldstein. And I want to give them an opportunity to say a few words. And if you guys could just stay on um, while uh, they kind of give us um, of where we've been and where we're going situation. Uh, because what they say now is going to be what we'll realize in 10 years, uh, which is kind of how it always happens. Uh, but again, thank you all. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, so, uh, committee council, if you can call on, uh, I think we're done with the council members. So if they're a uh, public speaking portion. Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. 
Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. First, we will hear from Eric Goldstein, followed by Justin Wood, followed by Kathy Nazari. Eric Goldstein, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good morning, Chairman Reynoso and Council Member Chin. Uh, I think it's exceptionally fitting that the two of you are here for this hearing uh, because you have been such great leaders all the way through on so many of these critical issues and we really appreciate your leadership. I'm Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'll be summarizing uh, our detailed written testimony today. Thank you for holding today's oversight hearing. We hope and pray it's not the last committee hearing of the year since there's still so much important work for this committee and council to complete before December 31st. Uh, but if it is indeed the fit committee's final hearing for oversight, we wanna take a moment to thank all of you, the committee members and your staffs and to acknowledge the critical waste legislation that you have moved forward over the past eight years. Commercial waste zoning, the waste equity law, plastic and paper carryout bags, polystyrene foam food and beverage containers, funding for essential sanitation services, including the uh, completion of the marine transfer stations, and even uh, resuscitation of the community composting pro program, although that is just barely alive. And that's just some of the highlights of the work that you and we and your committee colleagues in conjunction with commissioners Garcia and Grayson have done uh, over the past years. It is an impressive record. Turning to the topic of today's hearing, we highlight one major advance that's now underway and two that are critically needed. As noted above, we can all celebrate that this committee led the way in cooperation with former sanitation commissioner Garcia, commissioner Grayson and the Anderson twins uh, in advancing the commercial waste zoning law. This is historic legislation, which the department even today is working diligently to achieve and promises to completely transform commercial waste handling in the city of New York. Ensuring its full implementation in 2022 must continue to be a top city council priority. Without question, the biggest advance that New York City has not moved forward with is universal curbside composting collection. The current methods of disposing of the overwhelming bulk of the city's organics, landfilling and incineration are fraught with environmental problems. The uh, current program of voluntary collections, while well-intended, is unfortunately only a drop in a bucket and does not hold the potential to address the problem the way it needs to be addressed. Every major New York City planning document that has examined this issue from Mayor Bloomberg's Plan YC to Mayor de Blasio's One New York City to Speaker Johnson's own March 2020 Climate and Sustainability Plan highlighted the importance of universal curbside composting collection. Yet inexplicably, this legislation to create a universal curbside collection program for every city household has not been introduced. Time expired. This committee should not close shop for the year without at least holding a hearing or getting int uh, legislation introduced for this sensible and urgently needed idea, which is advancing or already in place in leading cities across North America. Another solid waste management advance that's long been waiting in the wings is municipal route collection and collection schedule adjustments. One of the biggest challenges the city is facing in its efforts to make the sanitation department a leader in sustainability is ensuring that our waste handling practices are cost effective. And a key strategy that municipalities across North America are applying is the idea of adjusting collection routes to better accomplish sustainability goals. This means, for example, adding additional collections from materials we want to encourage, like organics and recycling, while cutting back on collections for regular household trash. This would result in the same number of total collections to New York City households, the same level of service, but help maximize collection efficiency. 
Just such approach has been advancing in Toronto and Vancouver, for example, where they have cut back on the number of garbage and recycling pickups while adding additional collections for food scraps and yard waste. Obviously, such uh, route adjustments will require cooperation with our friends in the sanitation union, but we know such efforts can ultimately succeed and we hope the incoming Adams administration and the new council make such negotiations a priority. Two final points. A very sensible legislative proposal, intro 775B, skip the stuff, would make plastic utensils, napkins, condiments, etc., available to restaurant takeout customers only on request. This bill has the support of the restaurant industry and the New York City Hospitality Alliance. It would save restaurant owners hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a year. That's the experience in, in Los Angeles, where the sponsor of this similar bill in Los Angeles reports they're saving restaurants that have implemented this are saving $3,000 a year. The bill now has 26 sponsors, a majority of the council. There's absolutely no excuse for withholding a vote on this bill before December 31st. And this committee should get back together and hold a vote on this bill before the year closes. We're looking to Speaker Corey Johnson, who's been a friend of the environment on many fronts, to allow a hearing and a vote on this no-brainer of a bill before December 31. Finally, we urge the council to make this the last uh, committee hearing held via Zoom. Sensible restrictions like mask wearing and proof of vaccination should, of course, be required. But the council and the public will all benefit from the restoration of in-person hearings, and the time for that step has now arrived. And as you've done, uh, Chair Reynoso, we wanna thank uh, the staffs of the committee, including uh, Nadia and Jeff Baker and Jessica and uh, Ricky, or everyone who's been working behind the scenes uh, for their good work over the period in which you've chaired the committee. Well, what you have done uh, with Council Member Chin and the other members of this committee is really noteworthy, but of course, there's much more work to be done and we hope you're not putting your pencil case away just yet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Eric. I just wanna say, uh, fighting till the end, let me tell you, Eric, you don't quit. Uh, and I appreciate that of you. Um, and if I get the opportunity to host another hearing for the, the utensil bill, um, I will be more than happy to make sure I can, I can do that. Just wanna say in my next capacity, even though it doesn't happen often, our presidents are also allowed to hold hearings. Um, and really want to make sure that a lot of the things that we do, we continue to do um, uh, there. Uh, so thank you so much, Eric, for everything that you've done. Um, I don't want this to be my last hearing. Uh, you know, it will be December. Uh, so a lot of transition work is happening uh, and, uh, you know, Christmas and Hanukkah and, and all these holidays. Uh, so we'll see. I, I know maybe on Christmas day, we could do something, Eric. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be a lot of fun. Um, uh, time and a half, uh, <laughs> uh, but I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for everything you've done. And this won't be the last, Eric, we're family. So we'll be seeing a lot of each other throughout, throughout our lives. So, so appreciate you very much for being at all these hearings and helping me out and helping uh, push the narrative. Thank you. Amen again. to that. And thanks to Asher as well. Yes, uh, Asher Freeman is not on, but he's, uh, he's been doing a lot of work in our office as the legislative director um, and he will be Moving on with me, so hopefully we can continue that work. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I think uh, Justin is next, uh, committee council. Yes, okay. thank you, Chair. We will now hear from Justin Wood, followed by Kathy Nazari. Justin Wood, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Justin Wood. I'm the Director of Policy at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest and a member of the Transform Don't Trash NYC and Save Our Compost Coalitions. Um, thank you so much, Chair Reynoso. Thank you to uh, Council Member Chen. Thank you, Commissioner Grayson, and to the absolutely formidable council and agency staff teams who have been working so well with communities, workers, businesses, and all of the New Yorkers who have so much at stake in our huge solid waste system. Um, so I'm just going to echo some of what uh, Eric said and, and what so many have been saying. Uh, it's just a, it, it's been a tremendous eight years in, in many ways. Together, we've achieved what previous administrations and councils didn't. Legislation addressing the longstanding inequities of the waste system, 
policies that will address the notorious inefficiency, worker exploitation, public safety, and outsized pollution that's been endemic to the commercial waste system for decades. So this is a really exciting day with commercial waste zones moving forward and momentous that uh, this hearing is, is happening at the same time. Of course, we have some further suggestions. I wanna echo everything that uh, my colleague Eric said and a few other suggestions of the major work that, that lies ahead for the next administration and council and hopefully ongoing members of, of this council's sanitation committee. Um, first of all, we'd like to continue the progress on waste equity by allowing both commercial and residential waste to be processed at the city's state-of-the-art marine and rail facilities. This is something that's in the solid waste plan for these facilities to open to commercial. I think they should be open to staffed appropriately um, and should be viewed as a part of the commercial zone system that's being implemented in the coming months and the RFPs that were released today. This would further reduce truck miles, improve public safety in the districts currently uh, overly burdened with commercial waste and diesel trucks, and would allow material to flow to public facilities that have good safety practices and good union jobs. Second, I agree with everything that, that folks have been talking about. We need to rapidly increase recycling, especially organics recycling in both the residential and commercial sectors. And for commercial, this means ensuring that the commercial waste zone providers uh, bidding for these zones are prepared to make major investments and work hand in hand with their customer base to tackle the massive amount of recycled generated businesses. I also want to the these businesses need to be supported to implement waste reduction and recycling. So in addition to aggressively negotiating with the waste uh, companies bidding to ensure that, that they're building the right facilities and invest heavily in customer education, we would urge the city and sanitation department to continue to look for ways to ensure that independent and expert waste auditors are available to every commercial customer. Uh, just a couple more and I can wrap up. For the residential sector, we agree that this requires a universal mandatory organics recycling program that treats food and yard waste like any other recyclable material. This is critical to giving the millions of New Yorkers who rent or own apartments and multifamily buildings access to this basic common sense form of recycle, recycling. We also need to build on behavior change the commissioner rightly celebrated on plastic bags and the same with food waste and other plastics. Finally, we know that in both sectors, composting recycling is a major generator of good local green and hopefully union jobs, and that both are critical to reducing the life cycle climate emissions from waste, which we noted the state's Climate Action Council has now determined is the much larger contributor to our footprint than previously estimated. So we're really hoping to continue to work with all of you and we look forward to the transition to the next sanitation committee and um, building on this historic progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin, so much for your work as well in, in this movement. Um, you've been a staple uh, in, in the work that we've been able to do. And you know, for always having my back in these meetings uh, when uh, things get really difficult, um, and, and again, just centering the work we're doing. Um, I tell you, a lot of people don't know that um, there's a lot of pushback and a lot of power, powerful interests that really make our jobs very difficult. Um, and when you have folks like Justin around you, uh, it makes it that much easier. There's somebody you want in the trenches with you. So thank you so much, Justin, for, for all the work that you've done. Thank you, Chair. Next, we will hear from Kathy Nizari followed by Alex Shepenka. Kathy Nazari, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, Chairman Reynoso and members of the Sanitation Committee. I'm Kathy Nazari on behalf of Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. First, we congratulate and thank Chair Reynoso for all your hard work on, among so much, commercial waste zones and addressing waste as an equity issue. I believe you are the first council member to do so. It has been a pleasure working with you and your staff. We wish you the very best in your new role as Brooklyn Borough President and hope the incoming sanitation chair can fill your shoes. Looking ahead, we believe it is critical that zero waste 
to landfill also include N2 incineration, or we are creating one environmental problem for another. Our coalition that, that includes us, Big Reuse, Cafeteria Culture, Food and Water Watch, It's Easy Being Green, Oceanic Global, 350 NYC, and Upstream urges you to pass intro 844 and intro 2250 before the end of this session. Codifying and requiring DSNY to create a comprehensive zero waste plan are vital first steps to addressing municipal solid waste. The pandemic has only amplified the, the need to act now. M municipal solid waste is a significant contributor to greenhouse gases, yet it is repeatedly overlooked when discussing climate change mitigation. We paid more than $420 million to bury and burn waste last year, generating pollution and environmental degradation feeding the climate crisis. Solid waste not only intersects with environmental issues, but also with public health, social, and environmental justice. Much of Manhattan's waste is incinerated in Newark, significantly impacting public health and quality of life of Newark's lower income communities of color, where the childhood asthma rate of 25% is three times higher than the national average. This public health issue cannot be ignored. EJ communities have also suffered the most from destructive waste management policies exemplified by the more than 70% of our truck transfer stations located in just four communities of color. It is crucial to address the recycling rate of just 1.5% in NYCHA in a sustainable way, as well as the broader cities, nearly 18%. And we cannot emphasize enough mandatory curbside organics would reduce our waste stream by nearly 40%. Encapsulated here are proven strategies to reduce solid waste and its associated emissions. We are happy to discuss them further with you offline. Reallocate funding for waste export to landfill and incinerators to fund zero waste programs. Embed EJ into every waste decision. I'm sorry. Replicate successful programs from other cities. Successful NYCHA program. Then roll. Certainly funded. And for pass design guidelines for architects, developers, and city planners. Bob looks forward to working with you on these goals and thank you. Kathy, I your your videos went in and out. I just want to make sure that you were able to finish your testimony. Are are you finished? If someone could unmute or just give me a thumbs up. No, if you Thank you very much. All right, next we will hear from Alex Shapenka, followed by Oliver Wright. Alex Shapenka, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Thank you. And thank you, Chair Renoso, members of the City Council, and good morning to DSNY, who is here today. Um, DSN, I'm Alex Shapenka, Assistant Vice President of Policy at Real Estate Board of New York. Um, DSNY faces the daunting challenge of overseeing the collection of the, and disposal of more than 14 million tons of waste produced annually by New York City's businesses, residents, and institutions. We think proper waste management of the city's waste is essential for New York's quality of life and public health, and it's a task that DSNY recognizes and constantly searches for means of improving. Over the past several years, DSNY and City Council under Chair Reynoso's leadership have implemented programs and attempts to reduce the presence of semi-exposed waste in the public domain and improve city's waste management more broadly. I think some of the city's initiatives to improve waste collection and management include, but are certainly not limited to, Local Law 152 of 2018, or known as the Waste Equity Law, uh, the creation of commercial waste zones, as well as a pilot program for waste containerization and residential composting. The benefits of these programs cannot be understated and range from the uh, reduction of traffic congestion, greenhouse gas emissions, increased worker safety, 
fewer trash bags present on public walkways and sidewalks, as well as landfill diversion. You know, Rebney supports the city's continued commitment to bettering its services by imagining and implementing new solutions to keep our streets clean and New Yorkers safe and healthy. In the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the more salient programs that the real estate industry cares about. Uh, in 2019, Council passed Local Law 199 to create commercial waste zones. You know, this program will divide five boroughs into 20 zones, for which the city's contracts will be awarded up to three carding companies for the collection of waste within each zone. I think the city's approach seeks to reduce the tra truck traffic and the commercial waste collection by 50%, as well as strengthen the, the services and standards within the industry. You know, Rebney, along with other key stakeholders, has worked with DSNY as well as City Council in the development of the Commercial Waste Zones Law, and we appreciate the city's partnership and willingness to ensure that such a transformative improvement to private sanitation management is not a rupture from the existing commercial practices. Rebney also thanks DSNY for its continued partnership and thoughtfulness about the development of the program's framework and eventual implementation, which included delaying its rollout because of the disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We encourage DSNY to continue its measured approach as it finalizes the draft rulemakings um, that will be build that will build the program structure as well as its eventual implementation, including its instituting the commercial waste zones in phases to allow for a proper review of the program and address any potential challenges it may face. And I congrats to DSNY. I believe the second round of the RFP was announced this morning, so I'm sure you all are very busy with that. Uh, the other piece we wanted to, to quickly comment on is containerization. In an effort to mitigate the presence of waste and its odors in the streets, DSMY created the Clean Curbs pilot program in 2020, which allows for private ent entities and bids to apply for opportunity to have oh, containers and trash. Yeah. If I can continue just for one more minute, I'll be brief. Um, you know, we, Rebney supports the pilot program and encourages DSMY to work with the Department of Transportation to publicly report any of the operations of the program as part of exploring a, a possibility of expanding its scale. Um, and additionally, in recent years, city agencies have put forward ideas to expand the use of containerized waste systems in residential buildings. Rebney looks forward to continuing discussions with city agencies to consider how that would best be implemented to not be overly disruptive to development. Um, then I, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will next hear from Oliver Wright. Oliver Wright, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and members of the Sanitation Committee. My name is Oliver Wright, and I'm pleased to provide testimony at this oversight hearing on behalf of the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board. I'd like to begin by thanking Council Member Reynoso for his hard work and dedication as Chairman of this committee and by wishing him the best in his new role as Brooklyn Borough President. A big thank you, of course, as well to the rest of the committee and to DSNY for all your excellent work. The Brooklyn Swab looks forward to continuing to work with Reynoso and with the Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee and the SNY in 2022 and beyond. With regard to the city's zero waste goals and the creation of a zero waste plan, the Brooklyn Swab has previously highlighted the need for DSNY to be given appropriate resourcing and support to take an approach that's really holistic, evidence-based and outcomes-driven and to create a, a thorough plan towards zero waste that outlines a, a policy package where every initiative has a deadline and a quantifiable goal. This plan would bring together existing data on quantities, characterization studies and processing capacity, analyses of current and potential expenditure across all waste streams, opportunities for collaboration across departments, a focus on environmental justice and equity issues, innovations in technology and business models, legislative approaches such as EPR and the existing and potential impact of community and nonprofit initiatives. As such, while we encourage the City Council to pass intros 844 and 2250 before the end of this session as an important commitment for the City, the planning process outlined in intro 2250 would need to be greatly expanded in timeline and scope to produce a really meaningful set of actions. The Sanitation Committee played a crucial role in defending and re-establishing community composting in the face of COVID-related budget cuts in 2020. The further development of curbside collections alongside local solutions for collection and processing of organic waste is a key component of the city's move to zero waste of its response to the ongoing climate crisis and an opportunity to address issues of equity and environmental justice. The Brooklyn Swab looks forward to continuing to work with DSNY and the Sanitation Committee towards a citywide organics program that makes New York a cleaner, greener and more equitable place. 
a hallmark of council member Reynoso's term as chair has been the championing of environmental justice issued issues um, typified by the approach to the introduction of commercial waste zones. It's our recommendation that environmental justice remain a priority for the next committee chair, just as we're confident it will remain a priority for the incoming Brooklyn Borough President. Um, and finally, I'd just like to echo my reusable NYC coalition colleague Eric Goldstein's uh, call for a hearing and vote on the Skip the Stuff bill before the end of this session. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. I just want to remind panelists that if you have written testimony, that you can submit that at testimony at NYC, excuse me, testimony at council.nyc.gov. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Reynoso to offer closing remarks. Chair. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I couldn't, uh, I was muted, so I couldn't thank um, the Manhattan and Brooklyn swab and all the swabs in the city of New York. Um, we all know that this work, it takes an inside and outside game. Um, we, you know, these ideas are not born with elected officials, they're not born with the legislators. They come from like grassroots folks on the ground doing this work. And the swab is spending volunteer time um, out of their lives to uh, push forward um, an agenda that is like pro, you know, pro positive trash handling um, and I just, uh, and environmental justice and so forth. So I just want to thank the SWAPs for the work they do. Alex and Rebney, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a lot of work to do and um, we see Rebney as a, a needed partner. Um, and I, I want to say a hopeful ally in a lot of the work we're doing because you can help move a lot of the work that we think we need to move. Um, to get to th this city to where it needs to be um, and having Rebney as an ally can do more of that than not. So we're really looking forward to continuing to work together. So thank you for your testimony, Alex. Um, and uh, to all, uh, I guess the common, uh, the consensus here is that hopefully this is not our last hearing because we got more work to do. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, thank you all so much um, and have a good day uh, and spread love. It's the Brooklyn way. Peace. And Margaret, it's okay to be from the second best borough in, in New York. It's okay, Margaret. <laughs> Take care, guys. Take care.